Oh, he's coming there. <laughs> Archbishop, many of you will recognize him, Desmond Tutu. Uh, when this photograph was actually taken in Hyde Park in central London, I was standing just behind him. It was some years ago after the Nelson Mandela Freedom March. And many of you will know that following the fall of apartheid, um, the Archbishop went on to do a lot of work on climate change. And he was the main speaker when we had the COP uh, climate change talks um, in Copenhagen. And around about that time, um, I'd obviously met him several occasions when I worked for the anti-apartheid movement, but I also then found myself meeting him again in relation to climate change campaigning. And when it came to climate change, the Archbishop often used, used to use this African proverb. When you're faced with a very big problem, and climate change is indeed a very big problem, how do you deal with it? Well, you break it down and you deal with it one piece at a time. And when it comes to climate change, you'll have be familiar with this kind of pie chart where the emissions have been broken down, in this case, by sector. You can do it um, in different ways, but this is the sector breakdown. And both the threat and the opportunity for us in the world of wood, I often call it the wonderful world of wood, is that we've got 40% of it. 40% of it. The built environment is responsible for 40% of carbon emissions. That's more than any other sector. And it splits down into two parts. We've got the building materials, what we actually make the buildings out of at 11%, and then this much bigger figure to do with how we operate buildings, which is primi primarily about heating and cooling buildings. So we'll look at the, the first of these, and then we'll go on and look at the heating and cooling. I'm sure you know this, but it's worth reminding ourselves, and it's part of the story that we need to tell to the wider world. And earlier on, when you had that discussion with your neighbor and the words were fed back onto the screen, is we've got this challenge about conveying what we know is a good story amongst ourselves into that wider community. And it just isn't really quite working at the moment. And we've got to come up better, better ways of communicating. Um, and I think this is where the story starts. And it's a story that I would really like people in the environmental movement, in the NGOs in the environmental world to hear. And it starts here with a situation where concrete, or more specifically cement, is responsible for 8% of global carbon emissions. I mean, that is a staggering figure. The one material, one material alone, is responsible for 8% of global carbon emissions. And if cement were to be a country, if concrete was a country, heaven forbid, then it would be the third largest emitter in the world after China and the United States. And when I talk to friends and colleagues that I know in the environmental movement, this is where I start. I say, what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about the fact that we've got huge emissions from this just one material? You add in steel, brick, and block, which are also high carbon, and then you get the 11% figure that you saw on the pie chart. I think we should be honest with ourselves and therefore honest with the wider world. The most sustainable building is the building that already exists. We've got to stop demolishing buildings. Demolishing buildings should be the absolute last resort. There's a, a case celebre in the United Kingdom at the moment on Oxford Street, the main shopping street in London. This is the Marks and Spencers headquarters. In many ways, it's a fine building. It's got many years of life ahead of it. But because the land values are so high on Oxford Street, it makes financial sense financial sense to knock this building down and replace it with a bigger building. It does not make environmental or climate change sense to do that. We need to think much more about refurbishing existing buildings. And you can take the tattiest building that you just think, 
on the left there, let's just demolish it. But no, look what you can do with it, the same building on the right after it's been refurbished. So that's where we need to start in this business of driving down the carbon emissions from the built environment, which is by sticking with the buildings that we've got wherever possible. Now you know, because you're in Scandinavia, that 80% of buildings traditionally are timber framed, and that's the case out in the rural and in the suburban area. It's the case in the United States, it's the case in Canada, it's the case in Scotland, all over the world in rural, and in suburban areas, we've got timber-framed houses. And this is the problem that people like myself are faced with in dealing with politicians, whether it's in Brussels or in national capitals, is they've got it stuck in their heads that we can only build one and two stories out of wood. They have yet to appreciate the fact that we are now able to go, these are examples of American, typical American houses, clearly wooden framed on the left, the building in the middle is actually wooden framed, but it's been brick clad, so you wouldn't know. And what the politicians don't realize that because of the arrival of engineered timbers, and when I say arrivals, in the 1970s these materials arrived, but they're now starting to break through, as we know, into mainstream construction, whether it's cross laminated timber, whether it's LVL, or whether it's glue lam, we can now build at height and at scale for the first time. So that process of building with wood, which historically has been in suburban and rural areas, it's now possible to do that in the urban area as well, in the dense urban environment, where traditionally for the last 50, 60, 100 years, concrete and steel has dominated. And we still haven't made that breakthrough with enough politicians and decision makers that we have in wood a material that can go at height and can go at scale. And one of the great things about wood is, which many of you appreciate, it is a much lighter material than concrete and steel, and it opens up one of the opportunities, which is the halfway house between demolition and new build, which is to take the existing building and to build on top using this lighter material. So what I would say to Marks and Spencers in relation to their Oxford Street flagship store is think about building on top. You've got an, an, uh, an example of that in Stockholm here on the top right, where a factory has had um, a wooden extension on top. And two other examples, one from the United States and one from London, where we've built on top using wood. But this getting the message through that you can now build tall with wood is something that we're still having to, to work on. This was the first of the big wooden buildings, which went up in 2015 in Bergen. Um, I was lucky enough to have built, see it being built when it was halfway up. Um, and that wasn't the tallest wooden in the b building in the world for m more than about 18 months, two years, because in Vancouver, student accommodation came along that was 18 stories high. So that, for a little bit of time, was the tallest wooden building in the world. But in turn, that was then overtaken by the Ho Ho building um, in Austria, which was the tallest building. And then the Norwegians, Chikili, came along at uh, an extra, is it 60 or 80 extra centimeters as a result of this structure, which is clearly not necessary entirely on the roof, <laughs> um, but was deliberately done to make it the tallest wooden building in the world. Um, now, obviously, let's be honest, we're not talking about going from 100% concrete to 100% timber. There's all sorts of reasons why that doesn't make any sense. Number one reason is our big timber buildings need concrete foundations to keep them up. So there's a place for concrete. And this building in Milwaukee, I think, is a good example of a hybrid building. So if you look closely, you'll see the first third of the building is the traditional concrete and steel frame, but the top two thirds of the building are cross-laminated timber. And a hybrid building like that drives down carbon emissions, and there's a place for hybrid. Um, this will shortly be the tallest wooden building in the world, which is near Zurich in Switzerland. Um, but I don't think it'll be the tallest for that long because last week in Australia, they signed off 183 meters, which is considerably bigger than anything we've got in Europe. And that planning permission has been granted. So getting the message across the decision makers that we can now build tall and big in wood is something that I think we've all got um, a job to do. And going back to that argument that I think we need to put to the green NGOs is, well, what's your answer to driving down carbon emissions from the built environment? 
if it isn't replacing cement with timber? Come on, what is the answer? There isn't any other answer. Timber is the only structural material that can replace concrete and steel. And the situation we're currently in could become, if we're not careful, considerably worse. This is a picture from Cairo, Egypt. The global population by 2050 will have expanded by an extra two billion people, an extra two billion people. Where are they all going to live? They're mainly going to live in the urban environment. They're mainly going to live in big cities and they're going to live in big, tall buildings. And if we don't get our skates on, if we don't move, they're going to be living in big, tall, concrete and steel buildings like you can see in that picture. We are in the process, and this is no exaggeration, we are in the process of building our collective mausoleum. That's what we're doing day in, day out around the world, particularly in the global south where the population is expanding. We are building our global mausoleum. As the Egyptian pharaoh Ozymandio said, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. That is a picture of despair because we will not get to net zero globally if we build for two billion people like that. Now you and I know that the number one question you get asked about building in wood is fire. What about fire? To which I just took possession last week of this wonderful photograph from Canada which is the newest fire station built in Canada on Lake Erie in Port Stanley, and it's built from cross-laminated timber. Why would you build a fire station out of cross-laminated timber if it was a material that was more dangerous than any other material? And as we know, whether it's a, a traditional timber beam or whether it's a cross-laminated timber beam, we have this charring on the outside when a fire breaks out, which provides a protective layer, and the structural integrity of the wood will remain for long enough for the building to be evacuated and hopefully for the fire brigade to arrive and put the fire out. Ultimately, building with wood is no more dangerous than building with any other material. Concrete explodes at high temperatures, steel buckles at high temperatures. They all ultimately will structurally fail but wood is no more dangerous. And that, I think, is probably something we also need to get across. It's also an extraordinarily beautiful material to build with. Um, this is a new mosque uh, that's been built and just opened in Birmingham, uh, the U in United Kingdom's second biggest city. It's a beautiful material. And we're getting more and more evidence that it is a healthy material and a material which you use, say, to build a school with, will increase educational attainment, I think the big breakthrough will be when we get the evidence, the documented evidence, that occupancy rates in hospitals made of wood are slightly lower than those made out of traditional materials. Because at that point, the health service in every country, certainly in the Western world, will do the sums, you know, a thousand patients a night, or it's coming down to an average stay of four and a half nights rather than five nights, and you can see the financial saving that comes from baking, making your next hospital out of wood rather than steel and concrete. Now, we're not there yet, but it's coming. So back to the pie chart, uh, the yellow part, the yellow part, much bigger. Um, and as I said earlier, it's primarily about heating buildings, but also it's about cooling buildings buildings, and increasingly it's about cooling buildings um, because of climate change. Our summers are getting hotter, and buildings that had never considered having air conditioning before are now thinking of having air conditioning, so they're using energy in the summer as well as in the winter. Um, this next slide that I'm going to show after this one is the most frightening slide I've ever seen since I heard Al Gore give his Inconvenient Truth presentation some 18 years ago. The slide I'm about to show you may look, at first glance, to be a very innocuous, harmless pie chart. I put it to you, it is the most frightening pie chart you will have ever seen. We have at a European level something called the renovation wave. 
The renovation wave intends to retrofit, renovate three quarters of the European building stock by 2050. That's 190 million buildings need primarily to be better insulated. That's a massive market if you're sitting there with your business hat on. 190 million buildings that need to be renovated, that need to be better insulated. And this is what we currently use as regards materials for insulation. It's a 2014 pie chart from the Joint Research Council of the European Union, but it hasn't changed in the last eight years. 99% of the insulation material that we use in Europe today to insulate our buildings to drive down fossil fuel use is made from burning fossil fuels. So let's take rock wool, which is probably stone wool, the worst examples here. You may or may not know, but you take rock, you heat it to one and a half thousand degrees till it becomes a liquid, and then you spin it as if you were making candy floss, co cool it down, and you've got the sheets to provide you with the insulation material. But you've got to get it to one and a half thousand degrees, and to do that, you have to use fossil fuels. They've got polystyrene in there, which is from oil. So all of the materials that we use to insulate our buildings, to drive down our fuel use, to drive down our fossil fuel use, are made from fossil fuels. So what you're looking at is the law of unintended consequences in a pie chart. So we take two big steps forward because we've insulated 190 million buildings, but we've burnt a whole load of fossil fuels to make the materials to do it. So we've taken admittedly two smaller steps backwards. We've come a bit, but we've gone nowhere near as far as we could have done. And no one's really crunched the figures on this, but the implication appears to be the horror, the horror, the apocalypse now. The first horror is we fail to insulate. And if we fail to insulate, we won't get to net zero in 2050. The second horror is we do insulate, but we use the wrong materials and we burn a whole lot of fossil fuels, so we still don't get to net zero. So you can pick your horror, but one of those two is the most likely thing to happen at the moment, unless we get our heads around the idea that we're going to need to insulate using nature-based materials, of which there's quite a long list, but top of the list is wood fiber insulation. You may have heard that this is Extinction Rebellion in the United Kingdom have been blocking roads. Lots of main roads have been repeatedly blocked. People are going to prison, being fined. You might not agree with their tactics, lots of people don't, but their message is absolutely spot on. Unless we insulate, there is no solution to climate change. And this insulation is relatively easily done. You know, this is not rocket science. This is insulating lofts that haven't been done this is insulating walls that at the moment are too thin, etc. And in many countries, it's about stopping building new houses which are not well enough insulated from day one. Um, I'd like you to introduce you to Professor John Schnellenhuber of the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research. <laughs> Took me a while to learn that, actually. Uh, uh, and uh, he is well known in Germany and he's referred to in the tabloid, the, the lower media in Germany, as the climate pope. This is the climate pope. And uh, Schnellenhuber has led the thinking around the opportunity which is in front of us, which we really do need to grab with two hands, is that we could store a lot of carbon in the built environment by using more wood in the built environment and more wood fiber in insulation in the environment. Um, prize, if anyone can recognize where this is. Does anybody know where this is and what it is? Anyone like to have a guess at where it might be? What is it? I'll give you a clue. It's in Norway, so not too far away. This is Mongstadt in Norway, where they did um, an, uh, a carbon capture trial at scale to see whether they could capture the carbon when both gas and oil were burnt. And yes, you can do it. Um, it's incredibly expensive at the moment. Um, it's technically difficult. Um, the only place it is happening at scale is at Boundary Dam in Canada, at a coal-fired power station. 
And the latest report from boundary dams is not really working very well. It's not really working very well. Um, and lo and behold, staring us in the face um, is carbon capture and storage. Um, the, irony of, the irony of visiting Mongstadt, which I have done, I did go and see it. I do believe in carbon capture and storage at an industrial scale, if we can do it. We're going to need both, but it's not there yet. And to get there, you spend three hours driving through trees. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, can you see the wood for the trees? Um, and uh, insulating buildings and building out of wood, insulating with wood fibre and building, gives us an um, opportunity to store an immense amount of carbon in the built environment. So the trees sequester it, and then we store it, and you just keep doing the process over and over again, um, storing more and more carbon in the built environment. So we get these great wins. We can sequester, we can store, we can substitute, um, and the whole thing is sustainable and circular. And that is the fantastic story that we've got that we need to take out and explain to more people, particularly to decision makers, particularly to politicians, but above all to the green NGOs. And the challenge for many of us, many of you in this room, is if people like me can manage to persuade the politicians in Brussels to do more of this, are you ready? Are you ready to provide the materials? So let's take Stico there as an example. Uh, Stico have something like five wood fiber plants. And I met with them at their UK headquarters a couple of months ago. And I said, how many more plants have you got planned? And they've got two more. They're going to go from five to seven. They need 20 more. They need 20 more plants. You know, if you're making CLT and you've got four factories, you need 40 factories because we're needing to scale up and scale up really fast. And the only thing you can compare it to, and I wish I had a better analogy, but there isn't one, is a wartime economy. In 1938, in Britain, we weren't making any Spitfires. In 1944, we were making 500 Spitfires a quarter. Prince Charles, when he spoke to the COP in Edinburgh, alluded to the need to have a wartime type economy when it comes to tackling climate change. So we've got the answers, and if we get the political breakthrough and people turn around and say, okay, we won't insulate 99% with fossil fuel-based materials, we'll insulate with you know, 60, 70% nature-based, that is scaling up on a scale that no one has ever done before in anything to do with wood anywhere in the world, ever. So there's a big, big challenge. And again, we don't really have a figure for this, but it's somewhere around about that. As a result of my talk today, you know 25% of the answer to climate change, at least. At least 25% of the answer to climate change we know we know. That is colossal. If you go back to Desmond Tutu, one bite at a time, that's a bloody big bite. 25% of the answer to climate change is a significant increase. And optimizing, that's the word we've settled on after much discussion, we need to optimize the use of wood in the built environment. Yes, in construction, but don't forget the renovation. The renovation is equally equally important. And I think we need to go down this road, wi road with hope in our hearts. We really do. You might not get out of bed in the morning working in the wonderful world of wood and realize it, but you have the potential to be a climate champion. We are 25% of the solution to climate change. And that's just a really interesting way of looking at things. Thank you. Wow. It's frightening and it gives me hope. Thank you so much for being us here with us today. And I have one question because we sometimes talk about the NGOs and I wonder where they are in this discussion about wood building. What would you say? 
If um, let's take Friends of the Earth as an example. Um, so I give I give five pounds a month to Friends of the Earth. I think they're a great organisation, um, doing good work on environmental and on climate issues. Um, and if you work really hard on their website, work really hard, search engine, different pages, you will ultimately be rewarded and find some really good information on building with wood and how it will help tackle climate change. So the glass is kind of half full, but it's also half empty because you've had to work quite hard to find it and it isn't on the front page. Um, I spoke to, is there any journalists here? Oh dear. Off the record, off the record, nothing to do with Friends of the Earth, um, speaking about the environmental agencies in general. Um, I've worked in the NGO world. You need to recruit people, you need to bring the money in. It can be difficult. And campaigning for many of them is the way in which you bring the money in and you bring the members in. Um, and going back to Desmond Tutu, working for the anti apartheid movement, as a campaigner, it's much better to be against something than for something. It's just how it works. Against apartheid, against deforestation. It's an effective way of campaigning and it brings in the money. And I've headed up those departments in, a, in an NGO. So the campaigners are happy because we're recruiting, we've got good campaigns, the fundraisers are happy, etc. And it's a kind of model which is working. And I think we realize that to some extent the green NGOs have been a little bit disingenuous because clearly chopping down trees in the Amazon rainforest is in most cases, not all, but in most cases a bad idea especially if you're just replacing that with agriculture or mining. It's not a good way of proceeding. And what we do in the Scandinavian model or the European model of chopping down trees and replacing them with more trees because we replant to regrow is not the same thing. But visually, it is kind of the same thing. Um, and I think they've kind of sort of deliberately blurred that overlap because it works for them. And I think we've got to challenge them yeah. um, in the nicest way. And ideally, I'd like to have a kind of like three day conference where they all came and we came and we were all locked together in a hotel um, and we thrashed it out um, because I think some of the answers that we've got, they just haven't got. I mean, how are you going to house, house those extra two billion people in the global south? Mm. It's UN Charter is a right to have somewhere to live, a right to shelter. That's a human right. Where are these two billion people going to live? Um, and I've still yet to get an answer from green NGOs, other than if we were to use more wood as the only way of um, making sure that those extra people are not housed in a way which damages the environment. So ultimately, we're going to have to sit around with the green NGOs and thrash this out. And I think we've got good arguments, and I hope that they'd be willing to do it. Thank you. We will try to have an dialogue I think <laughs> yep. and I know that you are right now heading for Finland maybe you will convince some people there as well we should build more in wood if they are not already convinced and uh, we thank you again for coming here to Stockholm so nice to have you here and I have a gift for you and you know what it's made of wood thank you very much <laughs> thank you thank you